Our scripture reading this morning is from the epistle to the Philippians, chapter 3. Siblings, I do not consider that I have laid hold of it, but one thing I have laid hold of, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, toward the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us then who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, this too God will reveal to you. Only let us hold fast to what we have attained. Siblings, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the example you have in us. For many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. I've often told you of them and now I tell you even with tears. Their end is destruction, their God is the belly, and their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and it is from there that we are expecting a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humiliation, that it may be conformed to the body of God's glory, by the power that also enables God to make all things subject to God's self. The summer after I graduated from seminary, I was awarded a fellowship from an organization called Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics, which each year took 15 seminarians, 15 MBA students, 15 medical students, 15 law students, and 15 journalism students to Holocaust sites around Germany and Poland where the final solution was both planned and subsequently carried out. It was an intensive study program where the majority of our time while we were touring was spent in seminars and discussion groups. And the purpose of the program was to demonstrate to future professionals how leaders in all of these industries, the church, businesses, hospitals, courtrooms, media groups, fail to stand up and prevent the Holocaust. The hope was that by studying the moral failures of the past, participants could hopefully use their vocational platforms to stand up to injustice in the future. And the church, in particular, was certainly complicit in the rise and support of Adolf Hitler. Protestants overwhelmingly supported the Nazi party during elections in 1932 and 1933. They were excited about the idea of a close bond between the throne and the altar, between the state and the church. Under Hitler's leadership, what was known as the German Evangelical Church, or the Reich Church, came to prominence, and the goal of the German Evangelical Church was to function as a state church. Church leadership conspired with government leaders to require clergy to sign a statement of allegiance to Hitler. The church in Germany became defined by their support of a specific political leader and the parallels between the German evangelical church then and Christian nationalism today are frightening. There were Christians, however, who stood against the Third Reich and the German evangelical church. They formed the Confessing Church, which was an underground movement of Christians who refused to pledge allegiance to the Nazi state. One of the leaders of the Confessing Church, the theologian Karl Barth, who is a super famous guy among church nerds, wrote the Barman Declaration, one of the most important statements to ever be written within Protestant Christianity on par with Martin Luther's theses. And the Barman Declaration had six theses that stated that the church can never become subject to the state. Jesus Christ and Jesus alone is the head of the church, and people of faith should never bow down to any political figure. The words of the Barman Declaration echo the words of our scripture reading today, written by the Apostle Paul, a Roman citizen, who reminds us that our ultimate citizenship is in heaven, not in Rome, not in the United States. And as Christians, we are tied to one another, not by the boundaries of our nation, but by the higher calling given to us by the God that created us. A calling to carry out God's will on earth as it is in heaven. In an attempt to speak to that higher calling 
and in an attempt to help the church stand up to injustices in our present moment, I believe it is incumbent upon me as a clergy person and all of us as a church to wholeheartedly condemn some of the rhetoric that has been used in this election season. There's a graphic I've seen posted all over social media the last couple of weeks that says this. If you can't understand why your trans friend is scared right now, then you don't have a trans friend. You know a trans person. The transgender community has consistently been under attack in campaign ads, and one that aired this last Sunday and Monday during nationally televised NFL football games to millions of Americans should make you absolutely sick to your stomach. In the ad, Kamala Harris is condemned for supporting a law that allows transgender prisoners to receive gender-affirming care while in prison, and then condemned for supporting transgender athletes, and then the ad flashes this image, Kamala is for they, them. Donald Trump is for you. There is so, so much wrong with this ad. First, among many issues, none of the transgender individuals in the ad gave permission for their images to be used, and subsequently, the people depicted have had their lives turned upside down by death threats to them and their families. The ad completely dismisses the validity of they, them pronouns, which are not only used by the transgender siblings of ours, but also by our non-binary siblings. It also ostracizes and otherizes the transgender community by suggesting that Donald Trump is for you, not the they, thems over there that are completely different than you, the common American. And finally, it makes support of the transgender community into a political issue. And this just is not about a difference in political opinion. The lives of our transgender siblings are at risk, and we must do something about it. And sadly, this was just one of many campaign ads that have specifically targeted the transgender community and anyone who supports them. The result of this vitriol and this rhetoric is that anti-transgender legislation continues to be put forward at an alarming rate. 662 anti-trans bills have been proposed in 45 states in 2024 alone. One passed in Odessa, Texas just two weeks ago makes it illegal for someone to use any bathroom other than the one that matches their sex assigned at birth. And anyone who brings a lawsuit against someone violating the law can be awarded $10,000 in personal compensation, which effectively puts a bounty on transgender individuals and allows people to profit off of their persecution. It is understandable why the transgender community would be afraid for their lives right now. Their very existence is under threat, with popular radio hosts even calling for the elimination of the transgender community. Later this month, we will be hosting a Transgender Day of Remembrance service to remember transgender individuals who have lost their lives this year due to the de facto and de jure hate in our country. And church, if we don't speak up against the attacks on the LGBTQIA community, we are going to see their rights stripped away again and again, just like the liberties of the Jewish community last century. This is part two of a two-part sermon series meant to address our great angst leading up to Tuesday's election. If you missed Pastor Jen's sermon last week, I encourage you to watch it. It was a great civics lesson and a reminder that both the church and the state, while separate spheres, are designed to make our communities better for everyone. As Pastor Jen said last week, we believe in the separation of church and state, and as such, it is important for a church not to become partisan, but it is also essential for a church to have the moral fortitude to remain prophetic. As I've mentioned in past sermons, the role of the prophets in the Old Testament scriptures was not to predict the future. It was to hold political leaders accountable for their actions. I don't care what political party it is, but anyone who pays millions of dollars to intentionally target and oppress the transgender community must be stopped. 
And I will be the first to declare that our prophetic speech as a church must confront the moral failings of both sides of this nation's two-party system. Again, as I have said before, we have gone backward in our uh, humanity of our immigration policies and in an attempt to curry favor from moderates, President Biden has made it unnecessarily difficult for asylum seekers to find refuge in our nation. So too, the current administration in deference to foreign alliances has failed to prevent the mass bombings of innocent civilians, many of them women and children in Palestine. Children are starving and we are not responding. This is the exact moral failing addressed by the prophets in our Bible. Our government, as well as our churches, are currently failing to do everything in their power to address critical issues that affect people Jesus referred to as the least of these, such as affordable housing, climate change, access to mental and physical health care, and so much more. Abraham Lincoln, in the midst of the Civil War, declared that people were too concerned with worrying about whether God was on their side, and we know full well that God was used to justify slavery then, just as God is used to justify homophobia and transphobia today. Instead, Lincoln said, we should be more concerned with whether or not we are on God's side. When I mention that we need to be prophetic, not partisan, to be partisan, as many churches in our country have become, is to believe that any one political party is without blemish and is therefore worthy of our uncritical support, that it is the source of our salvation. Our passage from Philippians also reminds us that we will never find salvation in any man-made institution, whether it is a political party or a religious denomination. Our salvation is found in Christ alone. Now, don't get me wrong. I personally, as Jacob Buchholz, have my own individual beliefs that the results of Tuesday's election very much matter for the safety of our trans siblings and the rest of the LGBTQI plus community, for our dreamers, for immigrants, for women wanting control over their bodies, for people of color, people with disabilities, those practicing other faiths, and many more. And I'm allowed to have my own opinion about that, just as you all are all allowed to have your own opinions as well. But no matter what happens on Tuesday, when we wake up on Wednesday morning, the work of the church, the work that God calls us to do, will not change no matter what. I was going through some of my old sermons this week, and I found one that I had preached at a church I worked at from 2013 to 2016 that was dedicated entirely to educating people about what it means to be transgender. That sermon came at a different time, a different place, so many of the people in my church had never even heard of the term transgender, let alone knew someone who was transgender. The sermon was meant to educate people about the existence of the transgender community and why it was spiritually essential that we support our trans siblings. We're excited that our next brunch church after today, November 17th, will be a trans 101 presentation by a trans individual in our congregation, Celeste Irwin, so you all are invited to join. But in 2014, that church in Lincoln, Nebraska, was able to put our discussions into practice when Lincoln Public Schools made national news because they had asked teachers to use gender-neutral terms in the classroom. And church members were able to go to school board meetings to advocate for the district to keep their handbook on gender inclusivity when disgruntled parents were trying to remove it from teacher training. Later, an incredibly courageous transgender woman at that church in Lincoln agreed to convene a lunch where we invited all the pastors of the conservative churches in the city to a meal where they could meet a transgender person and ask her any questions they wanted to. And eight pastors took us up on the invitation and they came to the meal and it ended with hugs and expressions of mutual support. My final sermon at that church in July 2016 was a reminder that advocating for trans individuals should be at the forefront of our work as the church. And then our candidating sermon at this church in August 2016, where you all decided whether or not you wanted to hire the two of us, was a declaration that we believe that God is transgender. Now, all of that took place 
during the Obama presidency. And the work of the church to support the transgender community continued through the Trump presidency and the Biden presidency and will continue on November 6th and beyond. When we wake up on Wednesday, we will continue to strive to be on God's side rather than make God come to our side. When we wake up, we will strive to respond to the calling that God has put on us and has put on our church. When we wake up, we will stand up on behalf of our LGBTQIA plus siblings. When we wake up, we will work to dismantle racism and the patriarchy, which will still be alive and well on Wednesday. When we wake up, we will pray for and work to end the war in Palestine. When we wake up, we will advocate that all workers in our nation deserve to be paid a livable wage. When we wake up, we will try to be more sustainable so that we can protect our planet for future generations. When we wake up, we will proclaim that a woman should be able to make her own choices about her body. When we wake up, we will love all individuals equally, whether they are from a different country or practice a different faith or belong to a different political party. When we wake up, we will work to create more affordable housing in California. When we wake up, we will open ourselves up to learning and growing and stretching our faith. When we wake up, we will be ready for the Holy Spirit to lead us into whatever work God has for us. That is what our loved ones, whom we remember today on All Saints Sunday, were called to do before us through all the presidencies of their lifetimes. And it is what the generations that come after us will be called to do through all the presidencies of their lifetimes. And it is what Christ did 2,000 years ago in the face of the political power of Rome. He followed the call of God to preach good news to all people, even when that led to the cross. And not even the strength of the Roman Empire putting Jesus to death was able to stop that good news. So when we come to the communion table today, may it be a reminder to us that when we wake up on Wednesday, love will still win. Amen.